got some instructions from the Lord about teaching on the presence. And uh, hallelujah. Amen. I want to read to you uh, to preface today's message. I had it and then it went away, so give me a moment. This is that prophecy that uh, Smith Wigglesworth said in the presence of Lester Summerall shortly, sometime in the 1940s. I know it was before 1947. And in this particular encounter, Smith saw the coming revival. In fact, he saw several coming revivals. And it's so pertinent to where we are right now because I can see so clearly exactly where we are in this prophecy. So let me just read it to you first. And we've posted this many times. He says, I see a, now remember this is, this is before uh, the end of World War II for sure. Okay. So anyway, well, yes, if I had to be right about that time. So Smith Wigglesworth said, I see a healing revival coming right after World War II. It, it will be so easy to get people healed. I see it. I see it. I won't be here for it. And he wasn't. But you will be. And Lester was. <laughs> How many know there was a great healing wave of, a great wave of healing, a revival of healing during the 1950s? And uh, so many, even our own from Tulsa, Oral Roberts was one of them. Kenneth Hagen from Bro- Broken Arrow, Tulsa was another one. But that was the days of uh, so many. Uh, there were Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Kuhlman, on and on and on. So many. But it was a wave of healing. Now, how many think Smith accurately saw that? I, I, I believe, you know, how do, I forget now how many people he raised from the dead. I think Smith knew the Lord a little bit. Well, let's see. He says, I see another one. I see people of all different denominations being filled with the Holy Ghost. And, of course, we know that was the charismatic renewal where God raised up people during that area, during that era, like the full gospel businessmen and so forth. But it swept through Catholics. It swept through Protestants. I mean, everything from, uh, you know, everything. And we lived, did, did, would you say Smith accurately saw that? I, I believe he ac- accurately saw that. But then Brother Wigglesworth continued. He said, I see another move. I see auditoriums full of people coming with notebooks. There will be a wave of teaching on faith and healing. <laughs> of course, we experienced that wave that he saw, and we call it the Word of Faith Movement. Sue and I got born again right during that, that movement. I remember going to the Civic Center at the time, which was the biggest auditorium we had then. And we go to the Civic Center, and I, I would say, I don't care if we got there 30 minutes early. We still had to see, sit up in the nosebleed section, you know. <laughs> You're so high up. And we did literally come with notebooks and, and spiral notebooks and things to, to take notes on. And that has gone on for a long time. And we here at the prayer center have been very much involved in this teaching wave that has lasted quite a while. But then he said, after that, and this is where we are. We are right now in the transition between the word of faith. Let's say it this way. The uh, doctrine, the teaching, where that's the emphasis that God is doing. We're right now moving into the next wave that Smith talks about here. So he says, after that, the third wave. I see the last day revival that's going to usher in the precious fruit of the earth. Now now listen. It will be the greatest revival this world has ever seen. How many of you know that's in the blueprint? The, The blueprint, the Lord said the same thing. He said it even with more detail. He said it will even surpass the book of Acts. The way it's worded, we will see things that man, in the, in the blueprint, we will see things that man has never seen before. Well, man has seen the Red Sea split in two, 
and the ability to walk across on dry ground. Man has seen some... Re- Joshua and, his, and the Israelites, they saw the Jordan River, which was at flood stream. They saw it backed up. I could just see the hand of God coming. <laughs> you know, and it said that backed up all the way to the city of Adam. And that's prophetic. See, because Jesus didn't die just for the Jews. He died for all the seed of Adam. <laughs> could preach right, teach right there for a long time. That's good stuff. But he is saying this will, it will be the greatest revival this world has ever seen. Now, listen to this. It's going to be a wave of the gifts of the Spirit. The ministry gifts will be flowing on this planet Earth. Now, it's a big difference, and he didn't emphasize it here, but what's going to make it the greatest revival in the world? This anointing is not going to just be coming from the fivefold. This one is Joel's army. This one is where every one of you is a warrior. Every one of you will carry this anointing. And the gifts of the Spirit will flow through each and every one of you. That's what he said. Then he concludes right here. And see if this sounds familiar. See if you ever remember anybody ever saying this. I see hospitals being emptied out. (laughs) Our beloved Pastor Dave, how many times? How many times? I see hospitals being emptied out. And they will bring the sick to the churches. Where they, now, not all the churches. They will bring the sick to the churches where they allow the Holy Ghost to move. Hallelujah. From the 1940s. I believe if Smith saw all those previous waves accurately, which we have now lived through, and he didn't live through, but we have. I believe if he saw all those previous waves accurately, I believe he saw this last wave accurately also. And it so lines up with the blueprint for 2020. You can just find everything stated again and often in much greater detail. So recently, and I'm not the only one, but recently uh, through me when I was being the pulpit and he kind of takes over. How many are glad he takes over my mind a lot of times? Sometimes Gary still squeaks through there, but I'm so trying to get out of his way. And uh, he started talking. He said, this revival will be known as a presence. Presence revival. Now, my assignment then for this lesson today, he's had me go back through the blueprint for 2020. I'm talking about the original, the original ones that started through Bronx in uh, the fall of, ni- during the conference, actually, of October, so be October of 2019 through the one that ends with uh, your authority. Let me, let me get to move out of my authority. My first assignment was to go through those prophecies. I have them combined as a document. So recently, through me, he started calling it the Presence Revival. So my assignment for this particular lesson was to go back through the what we call the 2020 Blueprints Blueprint, and that's the one that begins in October of 2019 and ends with this one by uh, Bronk, January 12, 2020, called Move Out of My Authority. Now, there's been some very important ones since, but I felt like, my first, felt like the instruction I got was go through this first group and just search out the word presence. And let's see if he particularly emphasized anything about presence. Oh, did he ever. <laughs> now, the one I'm, re- I'm, wonder- I'm not going to read the whole prophecies because we'd be out of, out of time too quick. But the emphasis on, is on presence. How many of you know whatever we're walking in right now, and we are walking to a degree in his presence, I know that. But how many of you know this is not all there is? If this is all there is, please, Lord, just take me home today. But this is not all there is, Okay. So the, I'm going to reading from uh, the prophecy title, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will return. And the Lord says, no, I will take over. Now, when he says no, it's K-N-O-W. Know this. I will take over. I will take over in the days ahead. 
and I have already taken over through instruction and through presence. And when I say I will take over, it's not that I am not already in charge, but that which you solicit from me as in miracles and the moving of my spirit. How many of you know that's exactly what we're contending for? I said, short break. The nation will not produce revival. But revival will change the nation. Amen. So he says, this presence is involved in that which you solicit from me as in miracles and the moving of my spirit and that which will catch up many into a place of intercession. Those seasons will come upon you. They will last and they will fuel if you yield. They will be the fuel by which you will go further. This intercession. And then those seasons will lift and great works will be moved out of those seasons and wrought out of those seasons. Then I will come again and the heart of the intercessor will always be manifested in that place. Now, he's last couple of weeks, he's had me emphasize again Luke 11, where the disciples asked the Lord to teach them to pray. And so, uh, and the reason they asked him, they didn't hear what he was praying. If they had have heard what he was praying, there was no reason to ask, teach us what, you know, how to pray. Because they would have heard him and they'd known him. So he begins with the Lord's Prayer, which is really, we're not, that's not the, I mean, that's the essence, that's the heart of our prayer life, okay? It's not a matter of just quoting the Lord's Prayer verbatim day after day. And we're not going to teach on that today. But then he expounds in Luke 11 on the bread. You know, in that prayer is give us this day, or some translations give us day by day, our daily bread. Now, in that one, he's not talking about the bread that you need for your provision. He emphasized that in Matthew 6 when he taught there. And you do, we need to know the Lord is our provider. Amen? Now, but in Luke 11, he emphasizes a different aspect of the bread. And he says, God, God, I need bread to deliver to a friend of mine that has come on his journey, and I have nothing to give him. How many of you know in yourself, just, you, just like Gary Carpenter himself, in me, I don't have the bread. Not, not in Gary Carpenter himself, okay? So this is where the church is. We're going, we need the bread. Now, the bread he's talking about is to give it to somebody who needs bread. If this isn't even for you. you. You've joined the ranks of the intercessors now. This would be exactly what we see Jesus doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He would deliver the bread to the blind, and what would happen? They would see the bread to the cripple, they would walk. Bread to the deaf, they could hear. Bread to the bowed over person, they could stand up straight. That is the bread that he's talking about, and that's what we're seeking. Now, I know we're seeking him first, but he has called us to, bring, to be vessels through whom he's going to bring this revival. And he's giving us instructions on how to do it. And his, sure, we, there's a presence with each and every one of us. The kind of presence he's talking about here is different. This is where when you lay hands on the sick, they really do recover. This is where you pray for the, for even for the dead, and the dead will rise. This is where you pray for somebody who's missing a leg, and the leg grows out, and the whole world watches while it does via Internet. All right, so let's go on here now. Oh, I wanted to show the pattern. See, he says right there, there will be seasons of that intercession. Then there will be seasons of doing the works. And there will be, then it will go back, seasons of intercession. This is exactly the pattern that they saw in Jesus. He would go all night, he'd, a season of prayer. He'd be alone with his father, you know. And then when he'd come out and they'd go into the villages, wow, here comes the works. And they saw every kind of miracle, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is really the, Jesus said, we're supposed to be doing exactly the same works, did he not? And uh, 
it's, that, that's the dinner bell. That's what brings the sinners. And then you preach the cross and they get saved. Okay. 2020, if you allow me, is a, was a year. And I'm, I want to say it's right now it's crossed over into 2021. This is the season of intercession and intimacy with him. This is, yes, okay. Now again, I'm not going to ignore anything. <laughs> Who was I talking? I was talking maybe with Gene. I said, uh, what if? <laughs> what if in Luke 11? Now just what if? What if the Lord wasn't kidding? <laughs> what if that really was his pattern? Now, you See, your mind instantly goes, but he's God. He doesn't have to get in the presence of God. Jesus is God, you know. But see, what we keep forgetting is that God did not anoint Jesus the, the God. <laughs> it says God anointed, and it's worded that way expressly so we'll know it. God, have no, God anointed, how, the, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So, so I'm going to say it this way. The man part, Jesus of Nazareth, he had to get in the presence of God in order to have the bread when he come out to deliver to the people. Remember my little mini vision of what's been wrong with, with Gary? Y'all do know after listening to me, there's lots of stuff wrong with Gary, right? <laughs> A very imperfect vessel that he's trying to work through here. But uh, all these years, I mean, I, I've prayed, and I, I can get in the Word, and I've done some fasting, you know. And, but still, there's been very few times where I've literally been in that presence. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. It's the little vision he gave me. This is what Gary has been like. It's like, okay, here's the castle door. I know God lives in there. I know God has the bread. Father, uh, even if I call him Father, Father, I need the bread. But somehow, see, I was expecting the bread to come flying over the castle wall to me. <laughs> it's like manna in the Old Testament, you know. And if that's all there is to it, why have the seeking, knocking, and asking? He gave us a clue. No, the bread doesn't come flying over the wall just because you want it. The bread come, comes because you are his child. You can come into his presence if you want to, because he says everyone that seeks finds, everyone that knocks, the door is open, and to everyone that asks, receives. And then he says they receive something. They receive the Holy Spirit. Now he said, well, I've already, here we go again. I've already got the Holy Spirit. I can shandai right along with you. I can pray in tongues, you know. Well, we're going to see here, there's a difference between that kind of anointing and the supernatural anointing, okay? Now, I'm not even pretending that I know the end of this from the beginning. I just know what I'm supposed to do today. And that's get your meditator going, same with you around the world. Get your thinking cap on. But mainly, we cannot relent from the blueprint we have received, which has come away with me, and spend that time of intimacy in every way with the Lord, in his word, in worship, in prayer, in fasting, and always with obedience. Okay. All right, next paragraph. Whew, I've got to speed this up. That was 20 minutes on paragraph one. I will come. I will come in my services. I will come in my services like this and greater ones as I will, as in taking over the entirety of being able to saturate people with my presence. Now, the, the word saturate is important there. You can, I can have a washcloth, and I can take it to the, kid, to the bathroom sink, and I can, I can wet one little corner of the cloth, can I not? And that little corner has been baptized in water. <laughs> well, it has. But you feel the rest of the cloth, and you go, well, that's dry. What are you talking about? Well, it's not that there's not water there. It's not that the cloth has not been exposed to the water. The cloth has water, but there's a big difference between that and having that cloth saturated in water. When that happens, you, you put pressure on it. You, when you can wring that washcloth, and guess what? The water comes out. <laughs> See, that's what he's talking about, and I don't even understand the fullness of it. I just know this is where we are, okay? 
I'm going to read that sentence again. Help me, help me, help me, Lord. I will come in my services like this, and greater ones as I will, as in taking over the entirety of being able to saturate people with my presence. How strong, Lord. So strong that no one will move hardly or be able to exit the building. Well, that's, uh, that's worse cloth saturation for sure. <laughs> Again, I remind you of Azusa Street, the testimonies of the ones that were actually there. They said that, I don't know that we'll see the, the glory cloud. I don't know. But they did. And they said it would, it, it would come in that building and be like about three foot deep, like a fog or a mist or a cloud. And the little children liked to play in it. And they'd go running into that cloud and you'd see it swirl. <laughs> God, give us some of that. Hallelujah. Or how do we get into that? So his presence is going to come so strong. I mean, it came so strong in the Old Testament when they dedicated Solomon's temple. They couldn't even enter it for a while. They, they, they couldn't even enter the temple. And when they blew the 120 trumpets, how many thinks that's a coincidence? 120 people in the upper room? Type of being filled, baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, let me read a little more. I want to read that sentence again. It's, it, it so needs to be connected in our thinking. I will come in my services like this, and greater ones as I will, as in taking over the entirety of being able to saturate people with my presence, so strong that no one will move hardly or be able to exit the building. And from that, great glory will come to the city. That sounds like our revival or not. From that, there will be a magnet, a magnetizing to this place, not to glorify man, but they'll follow it all the way back to its origin. They will find, well, where is this coming from? Where is this talk of life, those things that are happening and spreading in the city? Where are they coming from? Where is the epicenter? Where is the core? And they will come back. Oh, excuse me. They will follow it back to this place. Many such services will I give unto you, and greater beyond. This is one where he says, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will return. The works and the essence. The body at large will be shocked to hear and to see what they will hear and see from this place. I put you unaware but do not be afraid that many will rush in the days ahead or when they see the explosion of my glory. They will try to merchandise it. They will try to catch, they will try to catch it up, gather it up in ways in which Simon the sorcerer said, Give me this and I'll pay you money for it. But as he was rebuked, so will they also be rebuked. What I am preparing you for is not something that comes and then something that goes. But I am preparing you and those who are a part of this and those of you watching and those who will hear in the days ahead that you will be part of something that is strong. It is as strong as case-hardened steel. It cannot and will not be broken by the times. It is a rock. It will not be broken by persecution. It is a rock that cannot be broken. It cannot be split. Now get this. It is the foundation of the sayings of my son. And as the apostles wrote upon these things and prepared the church. I, I saw and prophesied to you through many places that there would be an end time church that would welcome me back. Lift up your hands. We welcome you back, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. This is a place where we have Jesus meetings because Jesus is the meeting. He's running the meeting. He's doing the meeting. And it's all been done by the Father but through the power of the Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this place. Amen. If you agree with that, you can say amen. Now, this next one... <coughs> This is, again, the, one, of the, one of the prophecies in the blueprint. This one's titled, Move Out of My Authority. 
And he had several things to say about presence in this one. Part of me just wants to read, just take the whole hour just to read these again to, you, to us. They're so fresh. If you haven't, I see that was Gary, okay. Kings and priests, I have called you to be. Yes, you will lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. And that is part of the great outpouring. But part and much of the great outpouring is walking in a place where the anointing surrounds you and that it breaks all yokes. Your yoke that the enemy would fasten your life to with negative confessions and negative thoughts and a downward spiral is broken by my presence. And staying in my presence, that yoke is broken. As my word describes it, Positionally, then in experience, it is broken for you as you tarry in my presence, says the Spirit of grace. Well, that's incentive to me to keep coming to the prayer, prayer times, to keep doing more prayer time at home. But every time that we have a uh, assembly, a time of corporate prayer, be here. Revival is now. Through several people that I trust, the Lord has been saying, you can't really see it at this stage, but the revival actually has already started. He's already at work. I mean, say, say it with me. You are the way maker. You are the miracle worker, worker. You are the light in the darkness. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're still working. Even when I don't feel it, you're still working. You never stop because that is who you are. Amen. I believe we're already in the revival. I believe it's already started. I believe God's going to. Anyway, that's not the topic of today's message. Now, the second part of my assignment today and what I'd. <laughs> yes, sir. You talk about hard for a teacher. The second part was to go through the whole face-to-face -face document. Now, you may be listening and not know what that is. But over 20 years ago, I had, a, I had several encounters with the Lord where he would just almost like face-to-face -face speak to me. Uh, I recorded those and I wrote them down. They're available at the website, garycarpenter.org. Click on Media. And in one of the headings you'll see on the right-hand side is Face-to-Face. And we have it there for you in audio format and also in a printed format where you can print these out. So he said, go through all of the face-to-face -face documents. Now, when I said it's hard, oh, and, and highlight every time the word presence is in there. See what all I said about it in there. You talk about hard for me as I'm going and looking through those documents to try and just copy and paste one paragraph. <laughs> Because context is important and things he said before and things he said after. But if I, and there's a couple of times on here I've cheated. I have a couple of paragraphs. I'm going, God, this just has to be in here. <laughs> because without it, you're going to miss a, a, an important part of the instruction. But now those are available for free. Uh, you, you, again, go to the website, follow the instructions I gave a few minutes ago. And you can have access to all of those documents. Now, I will mention the title of each one as we go through here. And uh, you'll see he used, I need to explain this for people that's never, haven't ever read it or heard about it before. All through those documents, he would use the analogy of m myself being in a dense forest. I mean, so thick, you can hardly walk through it. But he would set a compass for me, like go in that direction. And in order to do that, the trees were so thick in this. Now, this is an analogy. I would have to cut down trees to clear a path to go that way, the way he called me to go. Well, we're going to revival, right? So when he says things like axe, you've laid the axe to the root of the tree. He's talking about those kind of things. It's, for me, it's a connection with that vision of being in the forest, not knowing which way to go. But then he sets your direction like a compass. Okay, now I need to go this direction right there. But all these trees are in the way. And he said, cut them down. What are those trees? What do they represent? Strongholds, wrong thinking, 
hurts, other things that prevent us from greed, and many other things that present, uh, prevent us from fully walking into where he wants us to go. So when, every time you see Acts, that's what he's referring to. So out of the one title of Marking the Trail, he said to me, and I believe he's saying to all of us, now you have laid down the axe for a season, and you have come to lie down in green pastures and drink of those still waters. Now, what he means by that, this was during the season, what I call the ugly building. And how many of you have ever worked so hard that you finally figured out it's bigger than you? You come to the end of yourself. And that's pretty much what I had done. I'm going, okay, I'm stopping this. I'm, stop I'm just doing my best to stop everything. At, in those days, I had an ugly building where I could go pray. And, uh, and so that's what he means. I would spend a major part of my day just prayer and also learning to distinguish God's voice. And this, that goes back to Dave's two, two tape series. I believe it's called that, Distinguishing God's Voice. And I would practice doing what he, what he taught. That's available to you at daveroberson.org. Go to the series. Click on series on the left. Scroll down till you come to Distinguishing God's Voice. If you've not heard that, then after you've heard it, then you need to do it. Okay. Marking the trail. You have laid down the axe for a season, and you have come to lie down in green pastures and drink of those still waters. This is where I feed your spirit with the very mind of Christ. This is where I will refresh you in every way, spirit, soul, and body, with the refreshing of my counsel, now notice, and the refreshing of my presence. You have now, in a new way for you, entered into my rest. Now, I, f I feel him wanting me to feel like he's asking me to go forward a little bit and talk about we all are already walking in a certain presence. I'm fast forwarding now to the one title, Communion with the Holy Spirit. That is probably, for this series, that is probably the most important one for breaking into a different level of, of, of his presence. So, oh my goodness. I'll read this, these portions. It says, many have not understood the difference between getting into the presence of the Father and the presence of the Son and being in the presence of the Holy Spirit by direct communion. Because they have not discerned the difference in the operations, they equate them as being the same thing, and they are not. Now, I've been reading that many times for 20, over 20 years. But your understanding as you mature comes to a place where you can receive something in a way you did not receive it before. What he's really saying is, and he says it many times through these, you're already in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Really, you, and you always are, even when you're asleep at night. Again, I'm going to have to read a little more in that one. I thought I could go back. I'm following instructions. You don't know what's going on inside of here. <laughs> here. <clears throat> this also is from communion with the Holy Spirit. When Christ came down from heaven to walk as a man among men, to be in his presence, the only thing needed was to be in his geographical location. Are we in agreement there? There he is. Here I am. I'm in his presence. And if you were walking with him, there was no spiritual activity, no great spiritual labor involved to turn to him and ask him the question of your heart. You would simply have turned and asked, and he would have responded to you as you see recorded in the Gospels. Now, as my son came down, so now has my spirit come down to be among men. The difference is, he is not limited by geographical location. He is with every son. He is with every daughter of mine all the time. Say it out loud, all the time. He is with me all the time. 24-7, 365, 
whether I'm awake or asleep, whether I'm in church or sinning. Boy, I heard stumbling right there. <laughs> he is, though. He is with you all the time. Okay. I'm, there's a point to be made there. We're coming back in a minute. Still in that same document. Hmm. I'm going to read those. As my son came down, so now has my spirit come down to be among men. The difference is, he is not limited by geographical location. He is with every son. He is with every daughter of mine all the time. I want your mind to be such that you understand you walk with him every day, just as if you had been walking with Jesus every day while he was physically on the earth. And then he said it in such a way that I, 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 I typed it in all caps and bolded this sentence. I have sent my Holy Spirit to be in the presence of man. Did you get that? He is available to you at all times. You are to turn to him with your questions, just as if you were turning to Jesus, walking side by side with him in the flesh. My Holy Spirit is with you, says the Lord, and for this purpose he has been sent. It requires no great spiritual labor to enter into his presence, for I have sent him to be in your presence, says the Lord. Again, I say, as the sun came down to be in the presence of men, so now my spirit has come down to be in the presence of men. He is in the presence of every man all the time, 24 hours a day, in every geographical location. Walk and talk with my spirit as though he were with you, for he truly is, says the Lord. The Holy Spirit is nearer to you than your next breath. Well, that's pretty close. <laughs> That's pretty close. He is with you. He will hearken to your voice. He will commune you with you as a friend, as a teacher, as a counselor, and as a helper. Now, I was sharing with Gene last night. By the way, Gene Gessner is a friend of ours. Uh, comes down from Iowa. He said, uh, when there's 10 inches of snow on the ground and it's 9 degrees, it's time to go home. <laughs> Even though he lives there, he calls this home and to be amongst the brethren because there's really very precious few he can talk to up there uh, about the things that are important, you know, that we like to talk about here. So I was talking with him last night that I saw something in here this time, I mean like yesterday or day before, that I'd not seen before. Because, you know, how many know the Lord is very precise in, in his word and he, he, he says something for a reason and he doesn't say something for a reason. Now look at this list again, talking about our, our, this type of presence that he's talking about where the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. Here's, what he, here's how he described it. If I can find it, there it is. He will commune with you as a friend. How many are glad about that? As a teacher. I'm glad about that. As a counselor. Oh, glory, I need his counsel. And a helper. I need all the help I can get. But I noticed this time he did not say, at that level of presence as your miracle worker. I had just never noticed that before. He is, let me read it to you again. He's your friend. I want to read it just the way he said it. He will hearken to your voice. He will commune with you, fellowship with you. The word commune um, in the Greek is koinonia. It means like talking with your best friend. But he will commune with you as a friend, as a teacher, as a counselor, and as a helper, okay. See, here's the big question, and I'm not through with that one yet. We'll come right back to it. Well, if I have the Holy Ghost, and He's with me all the time, and the Holy Ghost is God, and He is the molecule worker, and everything I said is true right there, then how come I don't see more miracles when I pray? That is exactly where we are. Welcome to the prayer center. <laughs> Welcome to our quest. That is exactly where we are. Because there is a presence. How many of you know you, you don't have to fast and pray and read the word and uh, even worship, spend time? You don't have to do any of those things to start praying in other tongues. Isn't that right? 
You can just start praying in other tongues. Isn't that right? Can you pray in other tongues without the Holy Spirit? No. Why? He is the one creating the language. There's a, a, a place that Dave talked eloquently and perfectly about, a place within us where the transfer is made from the Holy Spirit to our spirit, so that what the Holy Spirit says, we can say with our tongue, even though we don't know what we're saying. But that's, we, the Holy Ghost knows what we're saying. And we're literally playing, praying the mind of Christ. So you can't pray in tongues without the Holy Spirit. So if you're praying in tongues, he's with you. Are we in agreement? But then how come, Brother Gary, and I'm asking myself, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be the little nasalated flesh creature. How come, Brother Gary, if the Holy Spirit's in me, on me, walking with me, how come when I pray for Homer, his eyes don't open? Homer's our friend that's blind. He's one of the many that we're praying for. How, how come? Well, that's exactly the question. But here's the good news. He is about to answer that question. Because that's where we are. And it has something, it has a, there's a presence of God. Now see, let's say it another way. So when you come to sit down, B is, well, we got many, many, I'm so sorry, names, I know you so well. What's her name? Brenda, I know, she knows I know her name. But see, I'm not, we have many people here, right here now, that are very faithful to come to corporate prayer. Now, when you come and you pray, like on a Friday, from noon to 8.30, uh, that's a stretch. But I've done that, you've done that, many in here have done that, and not a goosebump one. I, there's been a rare occasions where something would happen and I would have a, an emotion, a feeling, uh, something would come. But not with praying in tongues normally. But yet you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit. You could not pray in tongues if you weren't in the presence of the Holy Spirit. There, that is the level of presence that we're walking in. But that is not actually the same type of presence he's talking about here. And apparently it's not the same type of presence where Jesus got the bread. Because Jesus was certainly baptized in the Holy Ghost. But yet he would go alone and, and spend those times with the Father that I'm seeing now. Is, well, what if he was serious? <laughs> what if this was actually how he did it as Jesus of Nazareth? Not, not God, the eternal Son. But as Jesus of Nazareth, what if this is how he did it? He had to get alone, go seek Ask, knock, go in, be in the presence of the Father. I mean, Jesus had the Holy Ghost 24-7, did he not? But still yet he had to go. See, he's still teaching us about these things. But it showed up to me this time. I said, well, he'd never, at this level of anointing you're talking about, at this level of presence, he's your friend. He's your teacher. He's your counselor. And he's your helper. Okay, let's keep going. He has also been sent, and he is the one who brings you into the presence of the Son and into the presence of the Father. Wait, there's a difference? Yeah, there's a difference. And I'm going to recommend another series to you by this up-and-coming young evangelist named Dave Roberson. And it's called Protocol for Petitional Prayer. And it's just a few lessons, three or four, Find it the same way, go to daveroberson.org, click on the left side where it says series, on the next page scroll down till you come to protocol for petitional prayer. And he teaches on that very thing, how the Holy Spirit brings you into the presence of Jesus, and then it's really Jesus that brings you into the presence, presence of the Father. So we've always just taken that verse to mean no one comes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I mean, you know, that's absolutely truth. But we have um, trimmed off parts of it to apply that only to salvation. And that's not all that there is. There's also for the believer to get into the presence. And I mean the, the miracle working presence of the Father. So the, part one of the jobs, and Dave even mentions that in, in, in uh, that I've listened to it recently several times, Protocol for Petitional Prayer. He says, it is the job. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring me, teach me, and bring me into the literal presence of Jesus. And he means presence. <laughs> hmm.
And then Jesus is the one that brings me into the presence of the Father. I recommend that series to you. Well, actually, I recommend all of Dave Roberson's series to you. Amazing to me, he's still got the more revelation knowledge than any man I've ever known. And we all enjoyed watching the Holy Spirit work through him, did we not? And I believe we will watch it again. Okay. Golly. We've got a... We've got a hmm. He has also been sent, and he is the one who brings you into the presence of the Son and into the presence of your Father, who is in heaven. Now this, now he's talking about getting into the presence of the Son, getting into the presence of the Father, this does require the stripping away of the flesh. This does require quietness of soul. How many know Dave says, the longer you pray, the quieter you get. Dave Roberson would say, we don't fast so that our voice is heard on high. We fast so that we hear his voice on low. Amen. Okay. Now, this does require quietness of soul. This does require often fasting of the flesh. I, st I actually thought about doing this, but this is a, that was a Gary thing. I thought about walking up to the pulpit, going, hello, I'm Gary Carpenter. Welcome to the prayer center. This is fasting season. Fast. Goodbye. <laughs> but that's cute, but that's not what he wanted to do. Okay. Now, remember how Dave would tell us all the time, he said, praying in tongues is a revelation gift. It is. It's a revelation gift. Worship he said, is a presence gift. And I'll tell you also, because I'm hearing it, there is such a thing as vain worship. You can go through the motions at home or at church, but if you're living a life of disobedience, your worship is in vain. Jesus plainly said, in vain they do worship me. Now, their sin was obeying, teaching as commandments, the, the things of man. Instead of the things of God. That was their sin. But you can be in other kinds of sin. I mean, you know, we're not talking about perfect. We're talking, anyway, major sin. And if you think you can continue in that, and your worship will still bring you in the presence of God, I think you've got another thing coming. That's the level where the Holy Spirit is. Where you're, you're, you're going to stay with him until you get purged. That's where the wall of fire, that's what we've been going through. Anyway, let me continue on. I can sure tell we're not going to get finished with this today. But he gave us some real clues about the presence. So to get in the presence of the Son and to get into the presence of the Father, this does require often fasting of the flesh. But through the avenues of, through the avenues of worship, it is my spirit that brings your spirit beyond the veil of the flesh into the literal Literal, he's not a valley girl. They, they abuse that word. Literal presence of the Son and of the Father. I, this often does require labor in the spiritual realm to acquire. But communion with my spirit is not so. It is not required of you to labor to enter into his presence, for I have sent him to be in yours, says the Lord. Understand, he is available to you in the blink of an eye. In a millisecond, he is available. Commune with my spirit, says the Lord. In the natural realm, a man who is walking a narrow, rugged, and dangerous mountain trail needs light while he's on the trail. Walking the trail in darkness while, quote, believing for light to come 40 days later would be of no value whatsoever, says the Lord. It is the same in the realm of the Spirit. I sent my Spirit to light your path on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis. He is walking with you, stride for stride. He is available to you, moment-by-moment. -moment. I have sent Him to be in your presence since you have difficulty getting into mine. He is with you 
commune with him as if that were so, for it is the highest order of reality. He says, do you understand my mind? Do you understand the plan of the Father for the helper I have sent to you? These are my intentions. I have not left you orphans. I have not left you to find your own way through this world of darkness. I have sent you my spirit. I have sent him to be in your presence since you have difficulty getting into mine. He is with you and, and, and in you. Oh, how my body has neglected the helper that I have sent. My body has not understood nor discerned the measure of help that he has brought to them. My spirit has been neglected and scorned and treated as one who must stand afar off. Every time I read that, I think of that song. I don't know the name of the song, but it, there's a line in it says, that says, I don't want to talk about you like you're not in the room. See, we're going to get past that completely. We're going to be so aware that he's in the room because he's in us. Okay? Yet he will not... So he's been scorned and treated as one that must stand afar off, yet he will not depart from the assignment that he voluntarily accepted. My spirit agreed to walk in the presence of men, that all of my mind and all of my wisdom and all of my counsel and all of my power might be made available to the sons of the living God. But as the Pharisees of old rejected my son, who came to reveal me, so has my body neglected my spirit who has come to reveal the Son. N neglect not your communion with the Helper. Now, we call a lot of things ministry. And they are. There's a, you know, we call a lot of programs ministry. Because what we have called ministry is primarily the things man can do. And it's not wrong. Like feeding the poor clothe it. And this is wintertime. It's cold. I'm glad there's a John 3.16 and a Salvation Army that's helping the homeless. And I'm glad that uh, they take up coats, you know, and give out to people that need coats and so forth. All of that is good. We're supposed to be doing all of that. But our assignment is above that. Our assignment is to go far enough into God to bring this supernatural revival into the earth. It's always been our assignment, and it still is our assignment, and that's where we are to focus. So the next one is called the highest order of reality. It's one of those, one of those at the, at the, uh, in the face-to-face -face documents. Quote, I'm just reading part of it. This is the ministry of Jesus Christ. And in the paragraph above it, he was talking about when Jesus would come to a village, he didn't leave it like he found it. The bl when he left that village, the blind were seeing, the lame were walking, the deaf were hearing, and so forth. And he's saying, this, this is the ministry of Jesus Christ. See, real ministry requires the moving of the Holy Spirit. Man can't open the eyes of the blind. Man can't raise the dead. I hear it right now. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's, that's where we're going. That's revival. That's where the vessels that the Holy Spirit flows through, our main thing is trying to get out of his way. <laughs> okay. So this is the ministry of Jesus Christ, and this is the ministry of Jesus Christ in you. The life he has imparted to you is the life which I anoint with dominion to manifest the will of the Father everywhere you shall go, not only in services, but in every encounter, as you are continually aware of my presence. As you continually hear my voice, see my visions, and comprehend my revelations to you, the results of the moving of the Spirit shall be in your wake also, says the Spirit of grace. Then he said this again. I, 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 I've had this at times. I'm probably going to do it again now. Printed this out on you know, big type on a sheet of paper and put it on my bathroom mirror, or, <laughs> or I'll see it at least a few times a day. Unless the Spirit of the living God is moved, there has been no ministry, says the Lord. That's what he calls them. I talk about we're soon going to be having Jesus meetings where he would recognize them. If he came and inspected our meeting, yeah, that's the way you do it. You teach, you preach, and you heal. <laughs> the blind see, the lame walk. Yep, that's one of my meetings right there. That's the kind we're coming to, okay? Oh, my. We're not getting it. Okay. I think that's enough for right now. Now, listen. I do believe we are, I believe we're in the beginning stages of the revival. I believe it might be ankle deep right now. And I think a lot of things are going on behind the scene, even in our nation. 
uh, that, that we don't understand, but I believe even though we don't see it, he's working. Even though we don't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops because that's just who he is. He is our way maker. He is our miracle worker. He is the light in the darkness. Amen. Now, our job, until he gives us different instructions, what do you do? You keep doing the previous instructions. Well, there, so we're, uh, now he has added, not added exactly, he hasn't changed. Let me say it that way. He hasn't changed any of the instructions in the blueprint for 2020. He has given a little more emphasis to a few things. But it all really comes back to intimacy. This is the year of intimacy with the Lord. Beyond praying in tongues. Because there's a, the, the, the purpose of today's lesson, to make us aware, there is a presence that we're all already in. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is why you can pray in tongues whenever you want to. He is there. He is ready. He's willing anytime that you want to pray. He is your friend. He is your counselor and so forth. But part of his job is to also teach us how to get in the literal presence of Jesus Christ, which he says is different. That's a different level of presence. And then into the level of the Father, that's a different level of presence. Because somehow as we do that, back to Luke 11, back to the castle wall, Gary is not going to stand there anymore looking for biscuits to come flying over the castle wall. I understand what he wants. I need to seek. Where is that door? I need to knock on that door. When it's opened, I need to go in and be in the presence of my Father. And he promises us he will give us all the bread that we need. Amen? We'll see you in 30 minutes. <laughs>